In today's video, we discuss how to transition to some sort of mouth blown practice or small pipe. Stay tuned. Well, hello everybody, I'm Matt Willis Bagpiper, and on this channel I make videos to make you a stronger and more confident piper. If you like this kind of content, please think about liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and hitting that bell icon to be notified of when I post new videos. I also teach Skype and online lessons if you want more personalized instruction, but more on that later. I'll warn you right now, I have a loud crow outside, no, not the bagpipe kind, an actual crow, so if you hear some background noises, um, I've heard you don't want to anger crows, so I'm not going to do anything to try to ward him off, but there might be a little bit of well, that going on. So if you've been working through my basic series here, you should at this point have five tunes under your fingers, starting with Pipe Sergeant Peter Bailey, then Amazing Grace, Hyra de Gerlach, Cor Holy's 43rd Welcome to the Northern Meeting, and the Brown Haired Maiden. Once you have those five tunes learned, memorized, and proficient under your fingers with all of the embellishments present, all of the grace noting accurate and at a reasonable tempo. They don't have to necessarily be absolutely full speed, but not too slow. You want them comfortable under your fingers because if you have those five tunes memorized, you are ready to move on to some sort of mouth blown practice pipe. In many traditional methods of teaching the pipes, they want you to learn around 10 to 12 tunes and then make the jump straight from the practice chanter to the Highland bagpipes. And that's fine. It works great. That's what happened with me. I went straight from a practice chanter to my Highland bagpipes, but for the past several years, I've been using some sort of mouth blown practice or small pipe with my students to kind of ease the transition from practice channer to Highland bagpipe. The benefit of it is you get to start making music on a bagpipe, one, at a reasonable volume. You don't need earplugs. You're not going to overly annoy your family. And it's going to start building up all of the nuance and, and skill you need in your blowing, squeezing, and transitioning. All of that is just as important on the Highland Pipes, but the Highland Pipes kind of allow you to just muscle through it. You can't muscle your way through these. This is about nuance. And once you can play this, all you have to do to move to the Highland Pipes is, well, you do have to learn how to strike in, and there'll be a video on that when it's ready up there. You don't strike these in, you just inflate them. But besides striking in, the only other thing you need, if you can play these, to play the Highland Pipes is the strength. You're going to have to build your blowing stamina, you have to build your arm strength more. But I find building strength is easier than taking strong muscles and then adding nuance to them. Starting with the nuance, I think, is the way to go, and I've had a lot of success with a lot of students making the transition from an instrument like this to the Highland Pipes. And something I did want to talk really quickly about are practice geese. That is a bad blowpipe and chanter, but no drones of any sort. I am not a fan. And the reason I'm not a fan is without a drone, I think you could possibly develop some bad habits in your blowing and squeezing technique because without a drone, without something sounding that is independent of your finger work, you may not be aware that you're not blowing steadily. We tend to blow along a pressure line where the low notes seem easier and the high notes seem more difficult to blow. And while in many ways that is true, that's not how we should be blowing a bagpipe. On the Scottish pipes, be it a practice pipe or the full Highland bagpipes, we want to maintain one steady line of pressure the entire time. The drone is a perfect way to hear whether or not you're actually maintaining that pressure or not. You will hear, even if you're not paying attention subconsciously, you'll hear your drone starting to dip and go lower in pitch as you back off your blowing, and as you blow harder, you'll hear it going sharp. Mm -hmm. And that can be a crazily useful thing to helping maintain that level of pressure. Without a drone, you can't really hear any of that. So that's just my opinion. I'm not a fan of practice geese. I really think you need to have a drone, even if it's just one, um, just so that you can be building even pressure and blowing skills and such. Today we'll be using the RG Hardy Twist Trap practice pipes here, but any sort of mouth blown small pipe will do the trick. So quickly, I put a practice pipe and a small pipe in two different but similar categories. The main difference is a practice pipe in my definition here is one that the drone reeds are actually practice channel reeds, as you can see right here. Kitchen pipes, I believe made by Dunbar, have a similar setup with two practice channel reeds, as do the Walsh uh, shuttle pipes, which are also a great option, um, have 
uh, practice channel reads instead of normal reads. And just for comparison really quick, a regular small pipe would have a more quote unquote traditional single read style here with just one tongue and a, a different read body. It's just a different way to put it together. And these work just fine for a learning instrument. This is a set of McCallum folk pipes. This would be a, a great option as well. They make them in Blackwood, they make them in Poly. Um, there's any number of uh, configurations. These are the folk pipes with them on the shoulder. They have across the chest ones. There's Walsh small pipes with a more traditional uh, reed design like this. There are McClellan studio pipes. There's a lot of pipes. I believe Shepard makes one as well. Um, the thing for the transition that I think is important is that it is a mouth-blown instrument and not a bellows-driven instrument. You don't get me wrong, bellows-driven small pipes are awesome. I have a set, I love playing them, but for this, if your goal is to transition to the Highland pipes, then you're going to want to be building your face muscles, you're going to want to be building the coordination between your, your diaphragm and your arm and all of that blowing stuff. So the bellows, cool instrument, but for our purposes, I think a mouthful and small pipe is going to be far more useful. All right, so you have your mouth blown small pipes. What do you do to set them up? Well, we're gonna walk through it as best we can here so that you can hopefully be making a good sound on your instrument here in just a few minutes. For the RG Hardy Twist Trap Set, this is tuned to Concert A or something very close to it. Your environmental factors and the reeds will possibly change that up a little bit, but this should be at A440. I have the Bra tuning app here, and I have a further larger tutorial on how to use it up here. But for today, what I want you to do, and you'll need the fully unlocked version to do this, is you're gonna have to go in, and I want you to set manually and put the frequency at 220, because this plays an octave lower than a pipe channer. So, have your reeds ready. This set comes with three reeds. I want you to test each of the three reeds in the chanter first. So we're gonna stick it in the chanter, and we're gonna put the lid on. And we're going to see how close this thing is to A440 slash 220. So you can see it's coming in pretty nicely here. I have check marks along the way and I would check each of the reads until you see the one that is tuning the best. So you can see here, blowing through it, I'm pretty good everywhere. The B is a little flat and the high G is a little sharp. Now, you can use tape. This is a bagpipe tuning tape. It's basically stage gaff tape. I got this from Henderson Imports, I believe. Um, but electrical tape works, pretty much any kind of tape works. And what you want to do if you're running sharp on a note is tape the top portion of the hole, as you can see right there. And the more of the hole you cover, the more it's going to flatten the note. So that, my friends, is close enough for my purposes on this instrument. You're going to want to check each of the reeds as best you can and see if at a constant pressure, first by mouth, if you can get them in tune and find the reed, use the reed that brings it in the best. The chanter is going to be the most sensitive about its reed selection. The drones at the end of the day are playing just one note, so they're less finicky about tuning. So I would pick the reed in a practice pipe, again, which has three typically matching reeds. Um, I would pick the one that tunes the best for the chanter. And if you have a traditional mouth blown small pipe with single reed, you're gonna just use the chanter reed it came with and adjust it as best you can, the height of the reed and maybe a little bit of tape to try to bring it in because, well, the drone reeds on that use a different style. Now, if your mouth blown small pipes have a cane chanter reed, like right here, this is the one with the McCallum folk pipes, um, but there might be other models of small pipes out there with a cane chanter reed. It is almost certainly attached to a moisture control system. In this case, do not play this by mouth. These reeds are very sensitive to moisture. Most mouth blown small pipes have a plastic reed. It will not be damaged by blowing it by mouth. So those you're welcome to try to tune it as I showed just a minute ago. But if it has a cane reed, you're going to have to do all of the tuning and adjusting with the chanter in the bag attached to its moisture control because I don't want you warping or damaging this reed with your breath. So be mindful. Cane reed, don't mouth blow it. 
All right, I'm going to go ahead and now put the chanter into its stock and go ahead and attach the mouthpiece as well. But we're going to do something a little bit different for the drones. So on the RG Hardy practice pipes, the base comes with a little stopper. Now, sometimes it doesn't like to stay in. You might need to actually put a little piece of tape over the end of it. Um, I've actually kind of put a few little grooves in with a, a knife to make it a little bit more likely to stay in there because for now we want to actually not have the bass sounding. We want to try to get the tenor drone into tune and we're going to do this first by mouth right now. You can stick both of these reeds in your mouth and you're going to want to put your lips down below the red section here of the blades of the reed and this is the same frequency as the low A of the instrument. On a set of Highland pipes, the tenor or smaller drone is actually an octave below low A, but on a set of small pipes or practice pipes, it's the same frequency, same pitch. So this should be around 220 as well. So I'm gonna actually look at the low A setting here as I blow this by mouth. And again, the bass should be stoppered up so you don't even hear it and we'll see what happens. You're gonna to wanna to try to mouth blow this at the same pressure as best you can remember that you blew the channer. This is to get it close to in tune. I'm not saying it's gonna be perfect when you fire this thing up here in a minute because, well, it'll be the first time you're ever playing it. It's gonna be weird. You're gonna be squeezing on something, you're gonna be blowing, it's gonna be a little odd. But I wanna try our best to get it into some semblance of tune. And for now, we're not going to worry about the bass. Now, if you have a set of pipes like these McCallum folk pipes here, they don't come with stoppers. So to turn these off. Um, there's a number of ways you can do it. I would recommend for the beginner getting something like blue painter's tape. That's probably the safest material I could think of, though I'd probably take it off after each session. I wouldn't want to mar, in this case, the wood over the top. You might want to try to fashion your own stoppers. You could probably use a toothpick and some dental floss wrapped around it until it fits in snugly. Um, but some sort of stopper, some sort of tape, because when we're starting, we want just that tenor. On the folk pipes here, you could still tune the tenor by mouth into the tuner, as we demonstrated earlier. Um, you would just want to put your mouth up and around the entire reed. You'd want your mouth over the vibrating section of the tongue right there. And then again, you could adjust the tenor top uh, out to flatten, down to sharpen uh, using that tuner. It's the same frequency, again, as low A, but we're not going to worry about the other drones but not all small pipes are gonna be so friendly. This one happens to let you take it out both together to get to both reeds, but not all do that. You may be able to remove the drone from the stock here. In fact, you should be able to, but it might be difficult. You might find yourself just needing to tune it while playing the entire instrument. It's not the easiest thing to do for the beginner, but at some point with any bagpipe, you just gotta dive in, get your feet wet. It's a technical instrument. It's quite the, um, journey you've decided to go on with me here uh, and I'm uh, happy to help you but at some point you just got to kind of get over your fear and uh, tackle the job. So let's go ahead and carefully put this in to the main stock as this is called and we're going to give the instrument a bit of a go and see how it's doing. With the twist trap practice pipe mouthpiece here the twist trap is actually the section of the mouthpiece right here it actually unscrews it's a two-part mouthpiece and it collects a lot of moisture, which is great. It also kind of gives you a little bit of resistance, which I don't think is a bad thing. Helps build up your face a little more, but it does make it take a little bit longer to inflate, actually, than a full set of Highland pipes. So don't be surprised that it seems to take a little bit to inflate the bag. So we're about to inflate this thing, but where are we going to put it? Well, if you've been learning in a traditional way, that means your left hand is on top, it goes under your left side. If you've learned with your right hand on top, you're going to have to contact the manufacturer of whatever small pipe you have and have them set it up in reverse because it'll need to go under your right arm. But I'm gonna assume most all of you have learned with your left hand on top, so it's gonna go under your left side. But where? Where on your left side? Where along your body? Well, one way I like to kind of show is go ahead and make a fist with your right hand and put it kind of under your arm. It's not completely to your side, but very close. And try to find the crest of your ribs, like where your rib cage is the widest. Um, and then put your thumb, like you're kind of mm, stabbing yourself with something right there so that you can actually feel like the knuckle of your thumb in your ribs. 
and then bring your other arm forward. And when I say bring it forward, I don't want you to rotate your shoulder around so much as to bring it forward like you're a toy soldier and find the point where your bicep kind of intersects with that fist and then squeeze right there. And I want you to squeeze your hand pretty hard. It's gonna involve probably flexing your arm and the intercostal muscles and maybe even a little bit of your lat. I want you to give it a good squeeze, but I also want you to try to keep your hand loose on the left. So you're gonna be squeezing with the top part of your arm and keeping the bottom part relaxed. What you should find if you're doing this correctly and your arms aren't very, very short is that you're somewhere on the bicep and well above that little pointy bit on your elbow. That's where your muscles actually insert. Um, the closer you are to that pointy bit, the more pressure you're gonna be actually putting on your fingers. So if possible, you wanna have the pipe bag being squoze by some part of your arm here against the widest part of your rib. And that's gonna intersect the bag at its widest section. So you can almost imagine like a Venn diagram of your ribs over here and the pipe bag right here coming together level. You don't want the bag below that. You don't want the bag above that. A lot of beginners actually tuck the bag up too high. If you get the bag up too high, not only are you not squeezing with the you know, strongest part here, but it might actually raise your arm up too high. So if your arm's above a 45 degree angle while the bag is here, rather than when you squeeze pushing it in, it's gonna push it more down. Whereas if you're at 45 or slightly less, as you squeeze, it's gonna more or less squeeze the bag into you, which is what we're wanting. At the end of the day, we play the pipes with our arm, not our face. That's why we have other bagpipes out there that have other air delivery systems like a bellows. Now don't get me wrong, the breath is an important part of this, but we're gonna regulate our tone with our arm more than with our face if we're doing it correctly. The drones, by the way, on a traditional set of practice or small pipes where they're in a main stock together should go across the chest, hopefully up at a, about a 45 degree angle. They might rest in the crook of your arm at first, that's fine, but you wanna to try to avoid just tucking them behind your head. That's more for the, again, folk pipe style where the drones are separate or the Gibson Firesides have a similar uh, setup there. So these should be going across the chest. So you could see there, it was close to being in tune with what we did to begin with, but it wasn't quite in. I've been doing this a long time. I could hear that it was off. So I reached up while still sounding the chanter and playing a few one-handed notes, um, a D. I actually even reached down with my pinky and played a one-handed C, um, as well as an F. I played a few notes and was adjusting the tenor just slightly on its tuning pin right here. And I was moving it both directions a little bit and just seeing which one sounded better while trying to maintain a nice even pressure. As a beginner, you're probably not gonna be able to get it quite this much in tune. And these meters can only take you so far. They are useful, but at the end of the day, you're gonna have to develop your ear to get them in tune. And it just takes time. So be patient with yourself, keep working at it, but understand that it's probably not gonna be perfect the first time out the gate. For those that have a more traditional small pipe with the easy drone or similar style reeds with a single tongue and a bridle and all of that, hopefully they're set up when you get them and you don't have to worry about them, you just might have to tune them on their slide. That said, if when you're blowing they're turning off, what you're going to need to do is move the bridle, which is the band on the reed, the tiniest, tiniest bit to let more of the tongue vibrate. You want to make the tongue longer. In the case of this folk pipe, the tongues are inverted, meaning they're actually pointing towards the drone rather than towards the bag. But in any case, you want the tongue to get longer. So in this case, I'd actually bring it closer to the end of the reed because of its direction. So I know this is very technical, but you're about to get involved in a very technical instrument. There's a lot of moving parts and we're just starting to get our feet wet here. So if it's too much, um, feel free to leave a comment below. Maybe I can do an entire video on that if you need more help. Hopefully it's set up by the factory. It's beyond the scope of this video to really get into how to do fine adjustments. But if it's shutting down, you need it to 
take a little bit more air. And when I go to move that bridle, I'm talking like a human hair. If you go too far and it's too loud, it's taking too much air, it's not working correctly or sounding correctly, you can always just close it back to where it was. So you're going to have to learn how to be a little bit brave uh, and kind of just, again, get in there, get it done. These reeds, when I got them, were just fine. They needed no adjustment to be played. Uh, I did a small adjustment because I'm very particular on the base, but that's because I'm picky. They still work just fine straight from the factory, and I'd like to hope that the pipes you get are ready to play when they arrive, if they have that style of drone reed. So now that your practice pipes are put together and hopefully at least close enough in tune to do a little bit of work, we're going to do some blowing exercises. I know they don't sound like fun, but they're very important. One of my favorites for beginners is to get a stopwatch or some sort of clock with a second hand and watch that while blowing and squeezing. We're gonna start with a four second exercise. Now this exercise is gonna be blowing into the pipes with just a moderate amount of force in your arm for four seconds. And then I want you to take four seconds where you're exhaling any stale air that might be in your lungs as well as inhaling. And that entire time, you're trying to control the pressure with just your arm alone. Now, this is just an exercise. When we go to play the pipes, we're going to spend more time blowing than squeezing. But after this many weeks or months of playing a practice channel, we're really used to commanding this little stick here with our breath and not our arm. This is a good way of using your arm to help you deliver the sound of the instrument. So I'm going to go ahead and just push start on this clock here, inflate this thing and go four seconds blowing, four seconds of squeezing, and I'm going to be holding an E and I recommend you hold an E as well. There'll be a future video about why E is such an important note on the instrument, but for now, let's hold an E, four seconds of blowing, four seconds of squeezing. How do you get to stop and not go? That is called a cutoff. What you're going to have to do is find a place in the bag, in the squeeze, if you will, that it stops the sound. You're looking for the bag to be about half empty or more. And when you do that and lift your arm with a little bit of urgency, it actually kind of pulls the air out of the stocks which are the parts that are holding the various bits. This is your channel stock. This is the main stock for your drones over here. When you lift up, the bag quickly expands and kind of pulls the air out and stops the sound immediately. This is going to take a little bit to build the skill. It's just, you know, going to be one of those things. But try from the very beginning to figure out how far you have to squeeze down, and it might be further than you think. As for starting any of these mouth-blown small pipes, it's just a little bit clumsy. I would have like a one-handed E and just accept that it's kind of going to up when you start. You can try to minimize that by hearing when it's about to sound. You can kind of feel it starting to sound. Try to get it more or less in position with your right arm and then kind of pop, not too hard, don't turn it off, but kind of pop your arm onto the bag as best you can to get it to start with as little wheezing as possible. Let's see how I do. Okay, so there it's making a little noise. And you can see, again, I work my bag down to a point where I know on this instrument that when I lift my arm quickly, it's going to stop. So you heard me, and I'm trying to demonstrate it correctly with a nice even tone. Yours may sound something like this. And you can see my drones are even kind of flailing all about. That is because I am not blowing and squeezing steadily as I'm playing right now. When you're playing the pipes, your arm is gonna be constantly engaged. While you will see my arm raising slightly when I'm inflating the bag, I am not actually lifting my arm. I'm just reducing the squeeze I'm providing on the bag so that the force of my breath is blowing my squeezing arm up. So on this set here, I would say my perceived exertion from zero to 10, with 10 being like I'm trying to like lift you know 200 pounds off the ground with one arm, 
and zero being well, zero, I would say my perceived exertion when I'm blowing into the pipes is around two. And I would say my perceived exertion when I'm squeezing the bag and inhaling, I would say my perceived exertion is about a three to three and a half. It's not a huge difference, but it is more. And then when I go to reinflate the bag, I am lessening my squeeze from that three and a half back to a two, but I'm not going to like negative one by lifting. I'm just reducing the squeeze, so I'm not squeezing quite as hard. It's really easy to treat this instrument like a big practice channel with a bag. And what I mean by that is that you can just blow, 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 blow as long as you can. And then when it's time to take a breath, you go Poop, and you take a quick breath in. The problem with that is that's not going to be how we're going to be playing the Highland Pipes. It's going to create probably a more stable sound for you when you're first starting because you're just commanding it with your breath. But we need to start transferring that work to your arm. So starting your practice sessions with a few blowing exercises is a good idea. But once you've done that, it's time for a tune. I would recommend Amazing Grace as your first tune because it's nice and slow and it can be as slow as you need. And on all those long notes, you can think about taking some time to squeeze down on the bat, give yourself some time to both exhale the stale air from your lungs, breathe in fresh air, engage that arm. Don't be surprised, don't be upset if the first time you go and play Amazing Grace, it doesn't sound that good. If you find that the channer is turning off, it's almost certainly from overblowing, not from underblowing. You'd probably hear everything start to growl if it was from underblowing. Overblowing is more typically the cause of the channer stopping the sound. And these practice pipes in particular, for many, they take less effort than you expect. A lot of people feel they're not working. I've answered many, many uh, comments and questions about my practice pipes aren't working and to a person I've been able to reduce their squeezing their blowing to a point where it now works and this is especially true for folks coming from the Highland pipes to an instrument like this you're used to really working very very hard on a set of practice pipes these don't take much effort at all they take a lot more nuance finally if you do have a set of these practice pipes from Hardy or the Kitchen Pipes, which I believe have a very similar design, and you wanted to get the bass going as well because it's a nice deep tone, I would, again, try to tune it by mouth rather than in the bag right now. That's a skill you'll have to learn over time, but it's pretty quick and easy to just start here. And again, put your lips around the bottom, the wrapping of the reed, not on the tongues, and just move the bass until it sounds like one with the tenor. <laughs> So that's one way you can go about trying to get the bass in and not have to worry about it with the whole instrument going. Um, but if you want to take a couple of weeks and not worry about the bass, that's just fine. You can go ahead and keep it corked. It's got a stopper for a reason. But that being said, don't tape over the tenor. You have to have that drone. I think it's very important. I want you having that drone. I want you being able to hear the steadiness of your blowing. So don't tape over that tenor. Find a way to make it work and in tune. Use your ear. Take some time dive in, uh, and yeah, get it in tune. So now that you have a set of mouth blown, either practice pipes or small pipes, I would recommend that you put your practice channer away. Now, perhaps your practice channer was the very one that was included with this instrument if you started here. And if so, don't take it back apart to make a practice channer. I want you to spend your time, as much of it as you can, playing this set and not your practice channer. It's really easy to get something like this, get frustrated at it quickly and put it down, go back to your practice channel, your comfort zone, play your tunes, play your exercises on that. But at the end of the day, we're trying to be pipers 
and having a bagpipe under your arm, having a bag to squeeze on, learning how to coordinate your blowing and squeezing on the instrument is critical to becoming a strong, competent player. Put your practice chanter away and become a piper. Play these. Just because they're practice pipes doesn't mean they're a toy. These are not a gimmick. Used correctly, this can be a powerful tool to make you the kind of piper I know you want to be. And for those of you out there watching this that are Highland Pipers considering getting an instrument like this, I recommend that too. I know I've had more opportunities to play for my loved ones on a small set of pipes like this than my Highlands. No one wants to hear Christmas carols on a set of Highland Pipes in the living room. At least, I mean, my family doesn't, but I could break out my small pipes or my folk pipes or whatever kind of small room-sized bagpipe like this, and I can play, and everyone enjoys it, and it's a lot of fun. On the Highland Pipes, you'd have to, like, go outside and, like, open the windows and stand down the street and, you know, annoy the whole neighborhood. Don't get me wrong. I love the Highland Pipes. I'm a Highland Piper, but I do that more for me, and I have a very patient and loving family that kind of puts up with it. However, with an instrument like this, you can make sound that is enjoyable for everybody. And again, for the Highland Piper, it's going to really start teaching the nuance, how subtle the difference between blowing and squeezing is. And you're going to be able to take that back to your Highland piping and it will definitely improve. And I think you're going to find that you're a little bit steadier. You're going to have a little bit more resonance out of your drones because your tone is going to be more stable. You're going to be able to get in tune better because your tone is more stable. So I recommend these for everybody. And again, I'm not brand centric. Uh, these are the twist traps. The kitchen pipes are great. Uh, Shepard makes a set. Uh, I mean, there's a ton of sets out there. Gibson makes the firesides. Uh, Walsh makes a variety of small pipes in both the practice type variety being their shuttle pipes as well as a more traditional uh, small pipe variety with the single drone reeds. I do think it can be an important tool for building your skill as a piper. Cleaning and maintaining a set of small pipes. Well, they're all going to be a little bit different. For this set here, you're going to want to make sure that you take the mouthpiece off and I would at least take the twist trap apart. Again, it comes apart at the base of the mouthpiece and um, it'll have some moisture on it. So have some towels or paper towels or something ready. I'd rinse this out at the very least, but you can wash it with some dish soap and water. Let it air dry apart. It can get all stinky and weird if uh, you don't, you don't want that. And on the twist trap where it attaches, where the mouthpiece attaches, this unscrews. It's very hidden. It's, it's actually quite uh, clever. It's very hidden. You can unscrew this and there is a valve in here. Now this isn't something I would clean every day or take apart every day uh, for no other reason. Uh, it's a lot of effort. You can see the valve right in there. This will come out. It does come out right there. You can see it. I would probably on a monthly basis, I would take this apart and rinse it all out. I've been doing that since I've gotten these over a year ago now. Everything's clean, everything's fine. If you're really concerned, you could soak the valve or even the, the base in some hydrogen peroxide if it's uh, seeming gross or dirty. But you wanna make sure that that uh, gets cleaned at least occasionally. And I'd leave it all apart to dry before putting it all back together. I would also take the chanter out. Now, it means you have to have a safe spot where you can have your instrument kind of laying out to, to dry and you don't want like cat claws in your bag. You don't want your dog chewing on anything. So you need to find a safe spot, maybe empty a drawer that you can then close um, if you do have animals around, but you don't want anything being damaged, but it can be damaged by being left inside and molding over. It'll start developing an odor and you don't want any of that. It's hard to get stink out of plastic. This can turn into a little fluff ball if you like leave it in and don't let it dry. So at the end of a playing session, I also take the channer out. Now, don't get me wrong. If I know I'm going to be picking this thing up like three times in a day for like five to ten minutes, I'm not going to take it apart between each session. I'll probably take it apart at the end of the day, but don't forget at the end of that last session to take it apart. Um, it doesn't take much. You leave this in over a weekend when you have been playing it all week, maybe didn't take it apart, you forgot a couple of nights, you might walk in and have a dandelion on here and have to replace the reed. And that stinks, especially if you got your reed tuned and going well. And on a set of twist traps like this, this is about the only real opening into the bag. So I also like letting the bag kind of dry out a little bit, air out just a little bit through that opening rather than keeping everything together. The bag does not have a zipper, so we can't access the bag to let it dry out that way. Other pipes do have zippers like that that you can access and get inside. Uh, if that's the case, I would recommend unzipping the bag. Now, many sets are going to have a flapper valve more like this that's sitting at the end of the blowpipe. This one's a little harder to clean. If it's 
all plastic. I'd probably carefully run it under some tap water. This is all wood, so I just kind of let it air dry outside of the pipes. Um, but if you have that kind of flapper, you want to be very careful. If that staple, that metal bit holding the flap gets bent, well, it's not going to keep a seal very well and you're going to have a hard time playing. But on this bag, you can see here, it does indeed have a zipper. So I can open the bag and in this case, get to the moisture control canisters. Um, that's, you know, a little bit beyond the scope of this video. I think unzipping the bag at the end of the day will go a long way from keeping anything growing inside the bag. So once you have the blowing and squeezing down, you're able to play your five tunes readily on your practice pipes. What should you do next? Well, you continue your learning. Um, the basic series is going to continue. We we're going to learn embellishments such as the grip, the taralua, and we're going to be incorporating those into more tunes. And then we have around 10 tunes. That will be when we make our transition to the Highland pipes. So please comment below with any questions you might have. I did my best to go over as much of this as I could, but I might not have been able to answer everything. And if I see questions that uh, are popping up more than once, I might make a couple addendum videos for this uh, because it's a big topic transitioning, especially if you're on your own and you don't have an instructor to help you. It can be kind of a big and awkward ordeal getting the small pipes started. So I'd be happy to answer your questions. Please just write below and let me know what uh, concerns or thoughts you might have. Well, thank you so much for watching, everybody. If you got something out of the video, please think about giving it a like, subscribing to the channel, and hitting that bell icon to be notified of when I post new videos. I also have a Patreon where as little as a dollar a month goes a really long way to helping support the channel. And I want to give a special thank you to Miss Carrie Tresek, who is my first $100 patron. It means the world to me. You'll see names of folks scrolling now. These are folks that contribute monthly to the channel. And I would want to add your name to this list. You often get access to the videos early and other perks. So check out my Patreon. I also give Skype an online lessons. Go ahead and head over to www.commandyourbagpipe.com or email me at the address you see here and we'll get you going. I'm working with folks from all over the planet and I hope to work with you soon. I also have a line of Command Your Bagpipe merchandise including hats and t-shirts and mugs and all sorts of stuff. So go check that out. Let the world know that you command your bagpipe. All right, everybody. I'm Matt Willis and until next time, cheers.